Okay. Um, thanks everyone for joining the session. Um, I'm Andrew Davidson, the Chief Executive of the Gwynedd Archaeological Trust, uh, and I'll be chairing the session. We'd just better wait one or two more minutes to check that uh, that everybody's come in. Oops. If we take it that Kerry is the last one in for the moment, we'll we'll make a start. I'll keep an eye on the awaiting room anyway, Andrew. That's Just brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, the, uh, the all microphones will be on mute um, unless um, you're invited to ask a question or to comment. Um, and if you wish to ask a question or comment, then again, you're familiar with this, of course. Um, at the end, raise a virtual hand uh, or put um, put any queries into the chat box. Uh, the session is being recorded, uh, as, a, as I'm sure you're aware, and the recording um, will only include the video and audio of people who speak within the session. Okay, thanks. Um, in 2016, the Historic Environment Bill Wales was passed. This required the Welsh Ministers to maintain the list of sites in all local authority areas and make the list available to the public. Arhulio, uh, maintained by the four Welsh Archaeological Trusts was the medium chosen for this. And this session looks at how we're carrying out an update to our Julio, uh, and we'll give three short talks. Uh, the first on the history of HERs within Wales. Um, second, background to our Julio by Sean. Uh, and the third, how we've actually approached the whole updating process uh, by, uh, by Rebecca. I'll start off with the history of the Welsh uh, historic environment records. Um, as I sure many of you are aware, the four Welsh archaeological trusts were established in the uh, in the mid nineteen seventies, uh, and they were largely created from existing groups uh, or from existing people that were actually working within the area uh, at the time. Um, there was quite a lot of work going on, mainly through rescue archaeology, uh, but of course uh, the, the, there was no integrated uh, way of undertaking this work, and it was done by volunteers, universities, etc. Um, and uh, and so um, one of the primary groups to uh, that formed in order to look after this was the uh, rescue archaeology group that was working in the marches. They undertook a, uh, some very very. Uh, excellent, uh, in fact, um, series of excavations on hill forts, etc. Uh, under Chris Musson, uh, and uh, along with another series of names of, uh, of some significance now, uh, as they've become. Uh, Richard White was working in northwest Wales and undertaking excavations, uh, and there were others elsewhere within Wales as well. Um, and the Di Morgan Evans and Richard Avent, um, between them, primarily led by Di Morgan Evans, uh, decided that it would be a good idea in order to form these um, the Welsh Archaeological Trust system uh, throughout Wales. And it's largely to those two people that we owe uh, the existence of the Trust since. Uh, and four chief executives were uh, uh, appointed. Um, Gareth Dowdall, Chris Musson, Richard White, and Don Benson. Obviously, it had been rescue archaeology that had really formed the, the, the impetus for this. Um, but very quickly, all four trusts became involved in monument management and, uh, and outreach. Um, and the idea of a British Archaeological Database it was, was, was identified. It had already been formed, and indeed Don Benson had been working in Oxfordshire uh, and had published several early articles 
uh, on the formation of sites and monuments records. Um, and when he moved to David Archaeological Trust, he immediately set about creating a similar system there. Um, the other Welsh archaeological trusts followed suit. Uh, and it's intriguing that the structure and many of the definitions used um, from that period still remain in use today. The PRN is still there. Uh, and uh, and the and the constituent elements of it are there, although of course now combined within uh, more modern software, the mapping system of the GIS uh, and uh, and the database combined. But nonetheless, it's quite intriguing when you read Don Benson's early articles, particularly the one in Oxonesia in 1972, uh, how much still remains from those uh, those early days. So in 1975, the David Trust purchased a research machine 380Z. It was surprising how expensive, in fact, some of these early um, early computers were. And the Gwyneth Trust, I know, uh, spent over three thousand pounds at that in in in, you know, in that money, as it were, in those days, uh, on uh, on a um, on a computer uh, to serve them, um, and they used largely. Uh, the software developed by English Heritage, particularly uh, Joe uh, Je um, Jeffries, who had been working with Don Benson um, in uh, in creating this. Oops. Like a number of the English counties, um, CPAT started in. 1978 to nine using the council mainframe there were real problems with this both in the transfer of data onto punch cards the time it took and the fact that the mainframe was used for salaries wages etc uh, and other things which took up nearly all its time and tried to find room and the time for the actually to maintain the smr within that uh, it was extremely difficult uh, so they bought their own uh, own computer, which the first one they got was an ACT Sirius machine um, that took larger capacity disks, 1.2 megabytes. Um, and those of you that remember WordStar, um, a non-Microsoft product, um, it was used to type the information onto record sheets. At the time, approximately 4,000 records were held, but the database is now, of course, just for CPAT is approaching 200,000 records. Um, so some, uh, some, yes, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't a, a, an enormous number of records, certainly. Uh, the computer was eventually donated uh, to a computer uh, museum by um, uh, Chris Martin. As computers and software developed, the uh, the trust moved on to the newer English heritage software. I mean, uh, the, the Delilah uh, and, uh, and subsequently uh, Samson, uh, again largely developed by Joe Jeffries at the time. Um, but Gwyneth and Clwyd Powys Archaeological Trust developed their own software using DBase and FoxPro. And if there's anyone there that remembers. Um, programming in these, they were eminently suita suitable for this process, for learning how to program and for de you know, um, developing uh, one's own systems. Uh, they were they they were relatively straightforward and simple to use, uh, and were uh, were excellent database management systems uh, of the time. Uh, FoxPro was um, developed by a different company to DBase, but nonetheless uh, run uh, was was virtually the same and would use pretty much the same commands. Digital mapping was being experimented with. I, I remember uh, certainly AutoCAD, FastCAD, uh, and eventually a GIS package map info, uh, although it took time to uh, to start to use this. And then in 1990, of course, we've got PPG-16 um, with its increasing need for functionality. Um, 
but it took a while for anything to really change and maps paper maps with their overlays were still largely used uh, at this stage for actually identifying the uh, the locations a seminar was arranged in 2005 um this was partly um partly jenny hall's idea who is currently working in Duved. And uh, two companies were invited to demonstrate their software, Oxford Archaeological Digital uh, or Oxford Arch Digital uh, and Exegesis. The Oxford Arch Digital software was called Toad. Um, and that was the one that the Fortress decided to go with, developed by somebody called Tyler Bell. Unfortunately, he left the company. That, um, and Oxford Arch Digital failed to, to actually get the software off the ground. It looked stunning, but um, it didn't, um, never quite lived up to its promise. Uh, and eventually the company went into liquidation. And so the whole, whole notion of Toad had to be put aside. Uh, and it was at this point that uh, Chris Martin went to Steve Smith, who had worked with the Four Welsh Archaeological Trusts uh, on several um, programming um, uh, developments uh, to ask his opinion. And he recommended the, uh, developing bespoke software. Um, this was agreed. There was a hiatus then, therefore it was difficult, obviously, to maintain the existing systems whilst a new one was being developed. Uh, and so there was a sort of hiatus in the maintenance of the AGRs for three years or so during this period, whilst the new software was being developed. Um, so this gave rise to AGR Wales, um, it's the basis of Peros which is available for use by other organizations. Uh, following its introduction, uh, there was a, a, a huge rise in the number of sites that were being put on. And of course, there was the backlog uh, over the previous three years as well to enter onto it. Um, but the sort of surveys such as the Coastal Survey of Wales, uh, new developments, um, road developments, et cetera, which is the bush farm, um, excavation that you can see there bottom bottom right uh, and the characterization projects that were undertaken at this time as well uh, resulted in uh, a very large number of new sites this is a medieval field system at, uh, at Nevin uh, this is a, an image of the Wales HER system uh, and what it looks like and what the current HER archaeologists uh, and officers uh, are working with. It's a good um, system. Um, it combines, of course, GIS database, uh, et cetera, uh, and a, uh, and a web, web server and can be logged on to from, uh, from anywhere. Then in 2016, as I said in my introduction, Historic Environment Wales Act was passed and it became necessary to develop software uh, that was available to the public. This had to follow certain rules. Uh, these are laid down within the statute uh, and uh, the external and internal information that had to be provided uh, is listed, uh, listed on this screen. You can see there's quite a lot there. Uh, that makes up um, this um, uh, this software package um, or that is shown on the software package uh, and it um, yeah it, it includes a lot of information as well as the uh, the core HERs which uh, which we continue to maintain uh, and uh, here's the the splash page or the opening page for uh, the current portfolio before um before the development right what i want to do now is hand over to sean who will tell you about the um uh Arquilio itself thank you andrew can everybody hear me okay oh, 
Can you hear me, Andrew? I certainly can. Yeah, That's I can hear good. you. Excellent. Now, let me just share my screen. All right, hopefully my screen is visible. It is. Yep. yep. All right, excellent. All right. So I'm Sean Darby. I'm the Historic Environment Record Archaeologist at Gwyneth Archaeological Trust. And I'm sort of talking today on behalf of all the HCR offices in Wales. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the history of Arquilio, which obviously provides public access to the historic environment records for Wales. I'm going to start off today, though, just by talking a little bit in a bit more detail just about the HCRs in general, um, before going on to looking at the internal system we use and then sort of how this all relates to Arquilio and how we've got to the point of today where we're looking at revamping it or have been. So a lot of you probably already know quite a lot about the HRs already, so I'm not going to spend too long on this, but for a bit more detail, they're maintained by the four Welsh archaeological trusts, each trust maintaining a specific area of Wales. You can see that on the right hand side of the screen. The HR as it looks today, it's a dynamic online relational database. So this is Wales HR or HEROS with integrated GIS digital mapping, consisting of the best available current knowledge of the historic environment that has been collected from a variety of sources over the last 46 years. It was formerly known as the Sites and Monuments Record, and it's now statutory, and the trusts make the data available on behalf of the Welsh ministers. The important thing about the HR is that it's continually being updated with new information or being enhancement to existing records. This is just an example of the Gwynedd HCR um, and the records that we hold that can really be divided into core and event records. Core records being sites um, can be anything from prehistoric all the way up to yesterday if it's deemed to be of historic importance. So things like hill forts, burial chambers, um, houses, fine spots. So each of the red spots that you can see there is a core record. And then as well as that, we also uh, keep event records as well. So things like watching briefs, excavations, field surveys. And because it's a relational database, we can link between the two. So if we have an excavation that's identified several core features, you'll be able to see that and vice versa as well. So the HCR is a statutory management tool underpinning all archeological work in Wales. It's a high quality evidence base for decision making and the work in the HCRs includes both the management of digital and physical resources. Uh, you know, I mentioned before about how the HCR is being continually updated. Uh, this little flow diagram on the, uh, the bottom left hand corner of the screen just sort of highlights how that works. So we'll get an inquiry in to the historic environment record. We will provide information to that inquirer who then might go off and do some field work or some additional documentary research. And this in turn will lead to new information that can then get fed back into the historic environment record, just highlighting how it's constantly being updated with new information. But as well as the, uh, as well as HEROS or Wales HCR, the HRs also include other material such as supporting digital resources, hard copies of maps and paper records, details of listed buildings, schedule monuments, slides, photographs, historic and modern maps, and additional documentary information as well. The HRs also all hold reference libraries of relevant texts, journals, and grey literature reports. So the important thing about the HR is that anyone can have access to the data, um, but the most frequent users are internal staff, commercial inquirers, local and national bodies, academic researchers, and private inquirers. Anybody can access the HR online via Arquilio, um, but it shouldn't be used for commercial purposes. Um, and it is available to everybody there. And we'll have a look at that in a minute. But before I do that, I can't really talk about Arquilio without talking a bit more about HEROS or Wales HCR, which is the system we use internally, as Andrew mentioned before. So I'm just gonna go into a little bit of detail about that. Um, Andrew's already covered some of this, um, but you can see that HEROS is a sophisticated online heritage management system providing secure access to heritage asset data. It's based on open source code and it's hosted online, which means that we can access it anywhere, which has obviously been very useful during uh, the pandemic. Um, it was developed specifically to meet what HCR needs and the internal system coined Wales HCR was operational in 2008. 
So to give you an idea of what we sort of look at internally, um, for anybody who used Arquilio, you might be able to see some comparisons here because the data is being drawn directly from Heros into Arquilio um, on a nightly basis. So this is what the core panel view looks like um, when we're using it in-house. So you can see the various surf search functions on the left-hand side of the screen, um, and then returned core results on the bottom left. And um, these are what we would call the parent record. And then everything you're seeing on the right-hand side of the screen, these are all the child tables or child records. So if you click on a different parent record, you'll see the corresponding child information. Accompanying that is a GIS mapper, um, which allows us to view all the data spatially. So you can see some of the information here. Um, you see background mapping, the red spots for all HCR sites. Uh, and then we've got other things in there too. Uh, you can see the Royal Commissions, um, NPRNs, which are the blue triangles, um, National Trust areas, which are the green hashed areas, and the red hashed areas are scheduled monuments. And um, the little donut shapes that you can also see around are the events. Just giving you a little close up of the parent records then. So you can see here, I've done a search just for Dinner Stinta um, and I've clicked on the parent record on the left-hand side of the screen. And you can see the information that's displayed in the summary and the description field. This will probably look familiar again to anybody who used Arquilio because it is drawing the information from here. So if we enter something into the summary or the description field, that's what you're seeing on Arquilio in the site record report. And then for the child records, you can see, again, some of this information you also see on Arquilio, but some of the information you don't, uh, and we keep internal internally, maybe because it's sensitive. Um, so you can see things like the event link, uh, the site type and period, condition and evidence information, bibliographic information, um, any cross-references with other data sets or PRNs, and the status as well, if it's a scheduled monument or a listed building. One of the good things about Heros is that we can improve what we record and we can sort of, we can build off of it um, when we work with Steve to develop new modules um, or new child tables. An example of this from the other year was the historic peoples table, uh, which now allows us to record um, people of historic importance and we can link them to specific sites. Um, and then we have the option in the future, of course, to maybe make some of this data available via Ochwilio as well. So that's the really good thing about it. But speaking of Arquilio, um, it obviously provides the public, it's the public facing. So if you think of Wales HCR as being the internal view, Arquilio is what the public see. Um, it was developed around the same time as uh, Wales HCR or Heros around 2009 and 10. And it's available to everyone, though, as mentioned before, it shouldn't be used for commercial purposes. It's updated nightly from Heros. So if a HCR officer enters information, into Heros uh, one day, the following day, the information will be there in Arquilio. So it is you know, almost as up-to-date as it can get really. Um, and it was launched originally by the Welsh Heritage Minister in July, 2010. These are just a couple of screen grabs of what Arquilio looks like in its current form. This isn't actually the first time though that Arquilio has been uh, revamped or relaunched. And um, the first time was in 2017, which is actually quite a few years ago now. Um, due to the Historic Environment Wales Act. Um, so statutory HR content was then made available through Arquilio on behalf of the Welsh ministers. And this includes designated sites such as listed buildings, scheduled monuments and conservation areas, battlefields, place names, and Welsh language content for HR records created since May 2016. You can see the sort of the layer list on the map there, which is showing some of this statutory content. So if you were to go on Arquilio today and have a look at it, then you would accept the terms and conditions of use, and then you'd be able to click through on the mapper and it would take you through to a screen like this, where you'd be able to search for sites um, and any results would be returned on the left-hand side and displayed on the mapper as the red spots. Um, so, and then if you click through onto one of those red spots, you'll be greeted with um, the actual site record. And there have been various changes to the actual content of Arquilio since it launched. Um, different things have been added at different times. For example, uh, the ability to look at grey literature reports. Uh, you can now do that. So when you click on the source, if it has a little PDF icon next to it, 
you can click on that and open the full report. Similarly, the related records function. So it allows you to look at any related records um, that are being brought across from the cross-reference field um, in Heros. Another thing you can do in our Julio is export your search results. And um, this gives you a little bit of detail where you can contact the HR directly if you want more information. Just to highlight why our Julio is so important, um, obviously it provides access to the core information stipulated in the Historic Environment of Wales Act. Um, it's also accessible to everyone. And, it, and as such, it sort of helps raise public awareness for the historic environment. Um, letting people know what's in their local area and you know, bringing it to their attention. From uh, my perspective as a HR officer, it's also useful as a first point of call for non-commercial HR inquiries. Um, so if we get an inquiry in, usually the first thing I'll ask is, have they looked at Arquilio? Because it might be that the information they're after is on there, or it might be that it, that can act as sort of a stepping stone to get them to narrow down their search when they contact me for information. So Arquilio has a variety of uses. Um, and one example that I was involved with myself was the Accessioning Arch Cam project, which was a remote volunteering project set up by Gwyneth Archaeological Trust during the COVID pandemic. This remote volunteering project um, looked at finding and enhancing existing HER sites using the Archaeologia Cambrensis journals that are available via the National Library of Wales um, to view online. So volunteers were using these journals with Arquilio to sort of see if they could find new sites or update existing information for sites we already had recorded. And as a result of this, 31 new sites were found and 1300 new bibliographic references were added. And this sort of project just wouldn't have been possible without Arquilio because it had to be a remote volunteering project. We wouldn't have been able to run it in the building, but without being able to provide our volunteers with access to the historic environment record, we wouldn't have been able to do it. So that just sort of highlights why Arquilio is so important. So I mentioned that Arquilio has sort of changed with the, the content of it has changed and updated, but the actual look and feel of it has stayed relatively the same. If we just look at these two screen grabs from 2010 and it's relaunched in 2017, not a lot has really changed. Um, again, if we look at the mapper, you can see from 2010 to 2017, obviously the content's been updated, you know, with the, the list of layers, but all in all, it's looking a little bit dated. And this was spotted um, by the Welsh Archaeological Trusts. They were aware that the website was outdated, specifically in regard to its appearance and the way the information was displayed. Um, it's no good having or adding new content to the website if so, the aesthetic user friendliness of it you know, isn't up to scratch. Um, it's also particularly important, given the statutory HR content being shown through Arquilio, that it was looking and um, you know, was easy to use. Revamping Arquilio would also allow for things like improving security a bit, accessibility, um, the use of it on mobile phones, for example, and iPads um, and tablets, and just in general, the user's experience. So when it came to thinking about how we were gonna improve Arquilio, the first thing to do was to put out a questionnaire. Um, a questionnaire was circulated um, to users of Arquilio to feed into the revamp. These questions focused on its use, accessibility, audience, and improvements users wish to see. Um, this information could then feed into the current revamp, but we could also use it going forwards as well. There'd be no point in sort of looking at revamping Arquilio just with just what we wanted if it wasn't going to reflect what our users wanted to see. Once we'd put out the questionnaire and received um, a number of responses back, um, an application was successful for CADU funding to help contribute towards an upgrade of Arquilio. Um, this upgrade was to build off the responses from the questionnaire and what the trusts wanted to see added to Arquilio and sort of how they wanted to see it improved aesthetically. Various options were explored for the revamp and Rebecca Bennett of Pushing the Sensors and Steve Smith were chosen to undertake the upgrade. So I shall now pass you on to Rebecca who will be able to take over. So thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, Sean. Um, are you okay, Rebecca, to continue? Looks like it. Ooh. 
you're on mute at the moment, Rebecca. Well, that's unhelpful, isn't it? It would make for a very quiet talk if I sat here on mute the whole time, wouldn't it? Um, so thank you very much, guys. Uh, as Sean mentioned, um, Steve Smith, who's the original developer of Heros um, and myself, were uh, commissioned in March this year to take a look at the Arhelio Refresh project and see what we could do in terms of balancing the uh, needs of the users. Um, as evidenced through the user survey, but also those core stakeholders within the Welsh Archaeological Trusts, um, our Archaeological Information Officers, the HER Officers, and also the wider Trust um, staff and personnel. So what I'm going to talk to a little bit today is the results of that survey and sort of break down what we found from asking people what they thought of it um, and how that's fed into um, the new designs for our Helio. I'm also going to give you a preview of the designs um, uh, through the presentation and then if you're really lucky and everything is working well I'm going to do a quick live demonstration um, of the new website which will be launched shortly. So you'll get a, a first look here uh, as a reward for turning up today and listening to us this afternoon. So um, what did we what did we find out? Um, uh, my co-presenters, I've noticed there's a couple of people in the waiting room. If you could let them in, that would be amazing. Thank you. Um, so what did we find out from our Arhudo user survey? Well, we had um, more than uh, 360 responses um, to the survey. Most of the respondents were from the general public, around 50%. And this was followed up by academic researchers at around 11% of respondents. And then commercial archaeologists and consultants formed just shy of 10% of the people who responded to um, to the request for, uh, for for their views on the current system. As you probably expect, the majority of these were based in Wales, um, and we were using Arcudo from a desktop. Um, we asked, or the, the survey asked specifically about the frequency of use, and around 3%, um, sorry, that should say 37%, I do apologise, there's a mistype there. Around 37% of respondents were using Arhelio monthly, around 25% were using it weekly, and 3% daily. So we've got a good core there of respondents who are very familiar with the, um, with the software and who are using it um, with a great frequency. Um, when we asked, I think you saw very quickly um, there on Sean's um, screen grab about how um, some of the elements of this existing system were ranked for ease of use. Um, and these included the explanatory pages, um, being able to find the correct search area on the map, um, finding and viewing images, uh, changing background layers within the mapping, um, accessing linked information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and having broken down those 12 elements um, on the survey, the overall ranking gave an ease of use score of about 6.7 6 out of 10. So generally, users were finding it um, usable. Um, it, it, that's not an awful score when it comes to um, software for sure, particularly software that's aimed at, that is very specialist, but aimed at the general public. Um, and what was quite interesting for me coming to this survey, so I, I didn't design or, or, or commission this survey, but what was really interesting to me coming to it and taking a look at the responses was just how, what a nice mix of both functionality and data questions um, were asked as part of it. So it gives us a lot of information there to unpack both for the development of our Julio as a, as a, a software and a system and a, and a public interface, but also for thinking about the future development of the HER and what people are looking for from historic environment records and data. Um, when asked to rank features of this website in order of importance, um, by far and away the most important one uh, listed was accessing, accessing PDF reports. And Sean spoke about how this was a development um, of the original system, which allows people to not just view a record, but then also go back and start to look at the primary information, um, the excavation reports, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that was really highly valued, sort of uh, stood, stood up and away from the other um, features in terms of ranking. People also really appreciated being able to search via the map, so finding a location and then finding the records rather than necessarily needing to know uh, the name of a record um, or, or a site um, specifically, um, and also being able to do that map search function without knowing the National Grid reference, uh, for example. Um, and they also highlighted that linked records from other providers um, were considered significantly more important by respondents than the ease of use on a smartphone. 
Now, this is quite interesting because in terms of web design and where Arcudio was after existing for 12 years with a relatively light touch development, um, one of the key drivers for this was to make it more um, user friendly across all modes of, um, uh, of, of, of computing. So from desktop through tablet and down to smartphone. And while this has remained at the core of what we've done in terms of the redesign and the restyling, what our respondents showed was that, first of all, the majority of them were using it from a desktop. So we're, we're using it um, in, a, in a specific way through a specific format. Um, but even if they want, and you can, and really importantly there, you could argue that the only reason they were accessing it through a desktop was because it was too difficult to access through a tablet. That, that's the, the counter argument to that, isn't it? But what the um, question around about feature and importance of features highlighted that even if we were to optimize everything for a smartphone, that was much less important to the respondents than some of the other um, the, the potential um, improvements highlighted. So two really key questions, um, as well as collecting um, uh, 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 quantitative data. We also collected some qualitative data, some um, sound bites from from people as to what it was that they particularly liked about the system. Um, so, in terms of what elements do you like, um, there were compliments around the speed of the data and actually how quick it was for both the map to refresh and redraw. The ability to be able to see data over different base layers, and um, particularly including the satellite imagery. Um, and I don't think it was mentioned, but um, it's worth pointing out here that Ahulio leverages the advantages of Bing mapping um, for two really key reasons. First off, you've got very nice um, high resolution and frequently updated satellite imagery um, that's that's hosted and managed by by someone else. Um, but also, really importantly, for the not just for our Hulu, but the other portals that use um, the, the Heros web interface uh, to display um, information and to collect information, actually, increasingly um, from citizen science projects. Um, the Bing API allows the, um, the, the viewing of Ordnance Survey 1 to 25,000 mapping. So you are able to see um, really nice resolution, very familiar, um, very high quality Ordnance Survey maps as a background without paying any additional um, uh, fee or in fact having to host that data set yourself. And so some of these um, some of these choices uh, are really quite critical into the way in which we will want to continue hosting the data and want to continue um, providing background layers as part of this project. Um, the spatial thing was something that you know people came back to a lot. They really do appreciate being able to have the the sort of simultaneous map and record interface. And if you think about some of the other projects that have been developed up over the last five years or so, we've seen a really big expansion. If you look at um, Covline, um, for example, um, some of the HERs across the UK have been developing this. I know that Jersey, for, um, for example, in the Isle of Man have developed up really um, nice looking public interfaces, which really marry together um, the GIS and the um, text record, the attribute record um, for, for historic environment data in a way that we weren't seeing uh, even five years ago. So people's expectations have really grown in, in, that, um, in that regard, and we want to be able to, to meet those uh, with what we offer through our Julio. Um, and a couple of nice comments. Um, <laughs> if you're going to get into kind of inter-country rivalry, which I'm, I'm sure we don't want to today, um, the, 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 um, the ability to do that as baked and into our Julio you know, more than a decade ago is something that people are highlighting as not being available through other um, systems in, in other countries, even now. Um, in terms of the things that they didn't like, very important to look at these two. So um, what was quite interesting to me with respect to the, the sort of clustering of some of this feedback was quite how contradictory it was. So where some people were saying it's really great, I can see, I can link into um, other uh, records, thinking about the designations, the scheduled monuments, the listed buildings, et cetera, et cetera. One of the key bits of feedback that was repeated was how difficult it was for people to link to other um, heritage databases. Um, and so I think really you can start to unpick the, um, the different styles of access, the different perhaps levels of users, though I don't really like to, to use that term, but maybe underpinning some of that very different user experience is the quality of user training materials 
and um, the, the way in which the system is presented to people um, and how accessible um, that is and how that, that user journey through accessing the website leads them to be able to access all the different elements that they are they are hoping to um, as, as part of their, their investigations, as part of their searches. Um, as Sean's already mentioned, the, the clunky dated look, um, they did also mention that there was quite a difference in quality uh, between different trust areas, but once again I'm not here to cause an argument between uh, either countries or different trusts. Um, and uh, so a lot of this was really around the general display, the layout, the font, the colour scheme, so really bringing it forwards into the 21st century. Um, but in terms of our team's approach, really doing that with accessibility at heart. Um, I mean, I mentioned that some it's really, really important to have this kind of feedback um, from the general public, um, but some of them end up being quite contrarian. So you, you do have to, to find a balance to um, to the way in which you interpret these data. Uh, uh, one person just repeatedly wrote, oh, I don't know, as I go straight to Kovline um, for every answer that they submitted, which while an important point in itself, they find it easier to find information through Kovline didn't really help us um, to understand why um, they found it easier. Um, and somebody even complained about the name. Um, there's not very much we can do about that at this stage as a recognised brand. Um, so we start off with the user survey and then we uh, met for a debrief with the stakeholders. So I've already mentioned the historic environment record officers at, at each of the Welsh archaeological trusts. Um, and it was really important that we were able to distill that user survey and the needs of the stakeholders into a succinct brief that was deliverable. Um, as, the, uh, as, as both Andrew and Sean have referenced, there was a, a, a pot of money, a, a pot of grant money from CADO to be able to do this in relatively short order. So we didn't have a particularly long time frame in which to do this um, project. And so between us, we needed to agree what was achievable, what was the most important, the, the highest priorities for us, and actually what a roadmap for future developments of Arcudio might look like after this you know, particular large scale investment um, at this point in time. Because I think it's no, it wouldn't be um, out of turn for me to say that actually the, the website would have benefited from more regular um, phased development, I think, through the time that it's it's been available. And one of the things that we're looking to do in order to secure its future is to is to start planning in um, these periods of, of refresh and revision and, and continuous development so that we don't have quite such a big gap um, between uh, between releases. So what was in the brief? Uh, design a new website. Very obviously, uh, it needs to be uh, it needs to be new. It needs to be fresh. It needs to be more accessible. It needs to be clearer and navigable um, for all those large numbers of the general public who are wanting to use it. And of course, it has to be fully bilingual. Um, we needed to review and revise the security of the web app system, making sure that, that integration with the Welsh HERs was still um, working really, really well and for all parties. So making sure that that nightly uplift um, and, and takedown of information was um, still uh, interacting really, really brilliantly. Um, and then deliver the improvements to the web map as identified um, both from the user survey and also from the stakeholders, taking into account um, the, the, the priorities list. Um, and, and delivering that. So myself, um, as a PTS consultancy, I uh, pulled together a team of web designers, um, Paul and Rachel at Artichoke, and of course, um, Steve, who's the, the Heros developer, um, to put together something that was really quite, uh, a, 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 just a really good skill set around um, delivering a new um, and interesting uh, uh, version of our hero, and hopefully one that um, you're going to like. So without further ado, I'm going to run through a few slides and talk a little bit about the approach that we've taken and the things that we've done. Um, so uh, in terms of key developments, uh, we have, of course, focused on style. So you'll see that the new website is a completely clean um, and, and refreshed um, uh, visual uh, identity. Um, right the way through from um, having actually a new logo um, to, to the site, all the way through to the way in which it's, uh, you can scroll down and access the information in a, in a really sort of seamless and, and slick fashion. And starting, as I mentioned before, with the, the premise of accessibility, so making sure the fonts are really clear, that there's um, great spacing, really good use of white space. So all the things that you'd expect from modern web design. Um, 
just taking back for a moment that question of how do people understand what data is on there Archeo has a lot of information it's a really um, complex and detailed source of information and so one of the things that we needed to do in terms of the information on the website and the wraparound the supporting documentation was to really clarify um, some of the web pages and make sure that it was really clear so an example of this here being about the data sources um, so where are all the sources of data and then making sure that we have those live web links through that people could find out more about where the scheduled monuments, for example, um, were, were hosted from and where they were maintained. And I think that this in particular should help to signpost people more easily when they are um, struggling to understand uh, which party owns which data and how it's been collated and, and curated um, within this uh, website. And there's also information, one of the things that came back in the feedback was um, how to contribute to the HR record. So, so in what ways can people suggest sites or suggest corrections to the site? So making it easier for people to contact the trust um, via a contact form and making sure that the, the full Welsh Archaeological Trust information is available to um, any user at the sort of click of a button, um, hopefully should, should aid that process. Um, in terms of the, the style, once again, thinking about how people access the site, that, that invitation, the sort of invitational style, that call to action, start exploring, pick your region. Um, and as somewhat as an artifact of how our Helio came to be, um, originally the search options gave unitary authority as the, the first, the default um, area of a selection. And of course that's slightly off-putting because most people um, searching this website from the general public probably wouldn't use that as their their default um, uh, geographical area to start searching by. Um, so we've been able to go back and and through a, a, a series of conversations with the various different um, uh, authorities and investor partners, make sure that we're all on the same page. We haven't thrown the baby out with the bathwater in terms of what the requirements are, but we have reflected back um, to the various authorities what the users want and how they're using it. And Fortunately, we've been able to find really nice tailored solutions um, that meet everybody's um, requirements, both the statutory requirement to provide information at unitary level, but also meeting that need of um, you know, the majority of users, more than 50% of them coming from the general public and not accessing or not wishing to access the data in that way. Um, to take a look at some key developments on the map interface, um, as you can see, we've rolled over here and this is not quite completed. Um, as I'll speak in a minute, there is still uh, work ongoing. In fact, I've had to call the developer and ask them to pause for just an hour or so uh, while we have this conversation so I can I can do the live uh, chat with you um, and hopefully do the live demonstration in a moment. Um, the key developments in terms of the map interface. Um, really around making more space, um, more um, clarity, better fonts, better spacing, um, better visibility of the records um, that are pulled up as part of the search, and also improvements on where to find um, the base layers. So I mentioned earlier the advantages of using the Bing API to provide aerial photography and ordnance survey and, and of course um, road mapping. Um, one of the disadvantages was that prior to this particular refresh, those base maps were held in a separate location. So they used to sit over in the top right corner. Um, so you effectively ended up with two layers menus. And what we've been able to do as part of this is bring those base maps into the, into the core um, layer menu. So there is just one location in which you can find all the different layers, both the data layers and the base map um, layers provided by Bing and things like the Ordnance Survey um, historic edition base maps that are provided um, from, from other providers. Um, a really important thing that I'm, I'm quite proud of and that we'd like to highlight because we don't think that this has been done um, very often or in very many other locations is to take, uh, we took a really um, detailed look at how uh, the colour schemes used on the mapping so that we could make these more accessible for people with different um, um, visual impairments, specifically looking through the different types of colour blindness and what can or couldn't be um, seen if you used a standard um, sort of palette. So on the left hand side here we have a, a, a typical sort of WebGIS palette which has um, a few key drivers um, behind it, uh, particularly the um, visibility against satellite data, which is a very important one, and increasingly against things like LiDAR data. 
So being able to identify those features and have them with a contrast to what is quite often a dark coloured layer behind it, thanks to the uh, lush green vegetation um, of, of our home country here. Um, but then taking, seeing what we can do in terms of um, modifying those styles, because the main problem when it comes to um, this sort of visual impairment is not being able to distinguish between different colours. The sort of shades end up, even though they might look um, to someone who doesn't have that that sort of um, visual impairment, it might look very, 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 very different. Um, when it comes to somebody who's got um, uh, visual impairment, those uh, those distinctions can be very, very minimal. So we put a lot of research and a lot of work into this and the result is that there are two effectively two color palettes which can be switched on and, and interchanged between at just the the flick of a button um, and hopefully this will really help to make um, the, the web mapping more accessible to those who cannot see the full range of, of colors um, and if anybody else has got other examples of that i'd be really keen to hear of them because um we we couldn't find any other um, online mapping specifically that was thinking about those issues in, in great detail. Um, so the next development, um, one of the things that people wanted to see and previously, if you just selected a record in Arcudio or currently, if you select a record in Arcudio, it opens in a new tab which has some advantages um, because, of course, you then have that record um, available to you and you can keep that, that tab static and go back to it. And it gives you lots and lots of retail space, lots of screen space to work with. But one of the things that um, users wanted to do was to be able to see any one of those records alongside um, the map interface. And so what we've developed here is an expandable um, portion of the screen so that, for example, here when you can see that the, the nave um, is, is selected that the prehistoric the record for the prehistoric cave there. Um, you can see that, that expands out and is um, scrollable within the main screen. So instead of having to switch between windows, you can see everything um, together and up front um, on the one screen, which I think is a really quite significant improvement um, in terms of usability and, um, and user journey through the data. Um, and then uh, another thing that we've we worked quite hard on and that we're really pleased as a, as a sort of a collaboration between the various different organisations um, to be able to have seamless integration of the Covline and the CADU um, records for any given site. Um, previously, this wasn't possible because the um, uh, agreements and arrangements hadn't really been sort of solidified and put in place. Um, but from the user's perspective, this will make it much, much easier to identify all the existing uh, records for any given location. So if we take, for example, here the, the Newton Henge, um, you can see the Glamorgan Went Archaeological Trust record for that site. You can also directly access um, through one click onto the onto um, the, the Covline record and again onto the Scheduled Monument full report from CADU. And these are all um, linked via URL, so they are um, extremely quick and easy to pull up these different um, different records. And of course, because they're linking to these um, standalone systems, um, it requires a lot less in terms of data overburden and management for the Arcudo system itself. It is much better to be able to, to um, uh, sort of seamlessly link out to the other databases and let them be in charge of the management of their data than it is to try and do that in-house and um, through some sort of download and upload process. Um, so things have really, really moved forward in this area and we're really excited to be able to allow people um, uh, sort of that access and that, that level of access to the different um, historic environment records that, that do exist. Um, very quickly, I'm going to talk about the roadmap to release. So um, we're very, very close to making this public. Uh, we, we had hoped that it would be um, public by today, but unfortunately, COVID has uh, caught up with us, sadly, within the team. Um, I know it's not supposed to exist anymore, but as anybody who's running a small business will know, it's still having quite a significant impact um, on staff availability. So we're hoping to complete the snagging uh, list this week and to circulate it to the what teams for their final comments and feedback, um, and then heading for a public launch in early November. So I think um, at this stage, uh, it might be helpful to take any questions um, from the audience. And then perhaps if people want to stick around, I could look at doing the live demonstration and sort of show people um, what the what the beta site is looking like um, and, and give them that bit of a preview after people have had an opportunity to uh, to raise anything they want to raise. OK, um, thanks very much, Rebecca. That was uh, that was excellent. Um, very good indeed. 
uh, and uh, and as you say, it's it's, it's the whole process is really exciting. Uh, it is a it is a something that's that, that's really good to be involved with uh, and to see it uh, see it develop. A couple of things that um, that I uh, I would like to mention following on from that. One, of course, is the bilingual element of it. That's important, uh, and we're following that through. Uh, second is that um, CADU have um, very generously funded uh, a part of this process, and we're extremely grateful to them uh, for doing that. Uh, and then thirdly, um, uh, as I'm sure many of you are, Chris Martin has been to a certain extent the, uh, the mainstay of many uh, aspects of the development of the HERs and uh, and working with Steve Smith, etc. Uh, and I'm grateful to him for the help that he's provided um, in uh, in today as well. Uh, Martin Lowcock is asking uh, a question. I think the previous version was optimized uh, for map searching. Is there any thought about enabling advanced thematic searching? Um, uh, well, unless somebody else wants to take this, I'll take this one. Yeah. Um, at this stage, no, because that's one of these areas where we really need to interface the data and the functionality. So as I mentioned, the user feedback was really, really interesting because the survey asked for information both about people's views on the uh, website itself, but also about the underlying data. Um, and I think that one of the things as and Sean will probably correct me on this, but one of the things that I think the whole team would like to aspire to is identifying th um, elements like thematic searching that require not just a, a sort of a new interface, but also um, quite a significant uh, look and revision at the data and how that is ported through from the HRs into our Helio. Um, Sean, did you want to pick up on that with anything I've missed? No, I don't think so. I think you've, I think you've covered it there. But I think it's really important to have these um, aspirations written down somewhere. Maybe I'm a bit too uh, <laughs> a bit too new age with that. I don't know. But I, but if you don't if you don't sort of whiteboard um, these ideas and these plans for development, then um, they can sometimes get a bit sort of lost in lost in the wash. So um, yes, thank you for raising it. And it is definitely something that we'd like to aspire to in terms of accessibility for that data going forward. Yeah, it isn't just the, the 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 technology behind that obviously but the way in which the data is structured and held uh which in fact you're not looking at in the at, at the moment and uh, but that has a large large part to pay for this of course and i think that we have to understand what the priorities of the her teams are um, in terms of this this continual progression, um, the way in which they they want to update the data, but also their you know longstanding commitment to translating um, as much of the information that is only held in one language um, as possible. So there there has to be a kind of a balance between the um, the statutory duty of the HER and the day to day working of the HER and the nice to haves in terms of the public interface. Um... Ben Wallace is asking, um, or he notices that the Gwyneth data was point data. Um, does that apply to the other trusts, HERs? Um, and will there be will they be polygonized in the future? Sean, do you want to take this on? Yeah, so yeah, all the data is point data currently for the four trusts. Um, as to whether it would be polygonized in the future. Um, I think there's many pros and cons to polygonizing point data um, that would have to be looked at quite carefully going forwards. Um, and also the sheer amount of uh, time that would be required to go back and polygonize a lot of, uh, a lot of the sites. So it, it's probably worth making the point that all new data that is acquired through um, uh, through certainly through CADU funding, yeah, CADU funded uh, projects uh, is uh, is polygonized data. Yes, it is. Yeah, and we do have we do have event data that's polygonized, um, but it's not really at a point where it could be made publicly available. It's more for just internal use. The event polygons. Yeah. What I would add to that from my experience of working, so the the other hat that I wear is developing up a series of citizen science lidar portals. Um, and what I would add to, to my observations of that is that when you are 
looking at a, a resource that's predominantly used by the general public, then the element of simplification that a point-based data set brings can be really, really quite useful. So the examples that I'm thinking of specifically in the Kent and Surrey areas where we do have polygonized data from the HERs, we have made a strategic decision to only display that as point data, to derive point data from it and to only display it as point data on the LIDAR portals, specifically because it allows the user to have a cleaner, clearer interface against which they can do the primary task, which is drawing polygons um, and, and creating data um, from the LIDAR data sets. So I think it's, it's it, yes, it was something that was asked for in the survey. Yes, there are definite advantages to having polygonized data available, but that needs to be balanced with the, the, the visual and accessibility of that data for the general audience as well. Uh, it, it makes the point that Scotland are currently going through this. Um... Uh, and and it could well be a, a well. It certainly, I would appreciate it a very useful discussion uh, to have with them uh, as to how best to the best to employ this method. And certainly, I mean, Canmore are really and Historic Environment Scotland are really leading the way in thinking about polygonisation too, and the um, the sort of GIS standards that need to underpin it. Um, and this is something that uh, some of you, a lot of you, hopefully will be aware that Historic England surveyed, um, did a survey for around about, I'm going to say nine months or so ago, looking at the, the standards for the creation of geospatial data across the historic environment sector, because um, once you start looking into it, it's a whole can of worms. We haven't really had um, sufficient cross-sector standards to work to um, and really until you get those in place then being able to produce geospatial data to a standard to then deliver to the general public um, it is quite tricky. Yes I agree. Um... <laughs> yes uh yeah interesting uh let's not talk about polygonizing listed buildings um okay uh the um do you want to try a demonstration rebecca is that yeah uh, shall we yeah i'm just gonna yeah. stop, stop the share very briefly while i switch over screens and restart it there we go can everybody see the website there Yep. Brilliant. Uh, so this is your your first look at um, the the new Arhelia website, and as you can see, it's much more uh, very simplified and very visual. Um, so we have uh, English and and Welsh available here. I'm looking at the Welsh view at the moment just to to prove that uh, it, it does exist. Not that I can speak Welsh. I do apologise um, for that. Um, but you'll see here that um, a couple of things that I've already mentioned in my talk, um, the ways in which people um, would would access the data so the immediate geographical boundaries we've we've sort of re reordered those and, and revisualized them um, and then just generally you know cleaning cleaning things up making the data more accessible and, and putting it into a, a, a wrapper that is um, a lot better now I'm going to switch back to the English version if you'll excuse me there we go seamlessly done and um, so and once again these invitations to explore the map at each point so really signposting people into to to where they're going so let's go and have a look i just accept all and then i need to do a little tiny bit of jiggery pokery there we go um, so this is the uh, the web interface, as you can see, predominantly, you know, it's so obviously because of the way it's being driven or it's being it's sitting above the, the Bing API, the actual maps themselves are, are very similar. Um, but as I mentioned before, we have the um, ability to uh, switch on and off the various different layers from Bing on the left hand side. Now, rather than having them under a separate menu on the right. So if I go I'll have a quick look over here. Um, so we still have the ability to search within the map view. Oop. There we go. Um, so I mentioned the accessibility. Um, more, a couple of things just in the snagging are the different icons um, for searching. So don't worry, these, these will change. Um, but if, for example, I'll put a couple of the other, um, I don't know what else we've got around here. Put the list of buildings on. And schedule monuments. So in terms of flicking between those different color palettes um, and trying to provide a greater um, level of, of contrast between those two. Um, and then in terms of functions, 
Um, you can see here the side slider. I'll try and find a long one. Mm, let's try that one. Nope, fine spot. This is where it would be better to have this demonstration being done by one of the HDR officers who know their data very well. Um, but here's one that's uh, sort of slightly, slightly off the page, and you can see how you can scroll down um, the record to read it. And of course, within here, you can highlight, copy and paste um, any of that information um, out as you wish. Um, so we also have the ability to add in the Covline records. So I'm going to zoom in and hopefully grab a few of those. So here's an example that I was uh, talking about. Let's find one where we've got, um, hopefully that one is both. There we go. So we've got a HR record listed here for that location and the Cobline record. So Cobline opening in a new window. Oh, there we are. And, oh, here we go. Because the point at which, because I can't see all my controls because Zoom is on, I can't access everything that I would necessarily like to. Um, but then also the ability to open these. So these are opening still in new tabs, um, but directing you through to the, the different uh, data that you wish for. OK. Um, what else haven't I talked about? Uh, cool things that were there anyway, but are still pretty cool in comparison to uh, most of the other um, services, not mentioning any names, but being able to access historic uh, mapping um, as well as the satellite data. So here you can see we've got the second edition Ordnance Survey, and this is served from the National Library of Scotland um, feed, which is, is really quite a nice um, to have. Um, and there's also the Ordnance Survey, um, uh, slightly uh, larger scale, um, early 20th century mapping as well, which is, is a nice to have. Um, I think that's probably about all I wanted to say, but I'm super happy to take questions or if somebody wants to go and look at something in particular, they could direct me um, around the screen. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, thanks, Rebecca. Um, Kate, who is um, a former, former historic environment record uh, archaeologist, um says it's looking really good um so thank you kate that's uh, that's very good of you no, thanks that's really kind of you to say so um, but yes as i say sort of watch this space um so we're hoping to do that nice public launch at the beginning of next month and uh, so much of what you've done of course is uh, you know we're, we're not really looking at here such as making it um, better available on uh, on mobile phones etc and yes. uh, and all this the thought that's gone in as you say to these uh, accessible color schemes um, and it's not not immediately obvious that these changes have been made but they do make uh, make an enormous difference and and have required an awful lot of thought and work yeah um, i think that's what i think that's probably one of the principles of good design isn't it that um actually it looks as though it should be you know like it just is so 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 intuitive and so simple but actually a lot of thought goes into um making it that way it doesn't just sort of happen out of the box necessarily and i think um we've we've had the right team around us this time in terms of this refresh um uh, yeah to be able to to move it forward and to get something that you know yeah looks looks good and functions really really well excellent okay um Ben is uh, is there a re Ben is asking is there a report on your revamp project? This would help us with the revamp of Heritage Gateway and other HERs uh, own online HER website. I'm letting you answer that as the as the contract uh, holder there, Andrew. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, well, I mean, there is there isn't one designed as part of the There isn't one at the moment. Um, it's it's a very intriguing idea, uh, and I think it's something that we should uh, we should seriously consider. Obviously, time and uh, and resources is always an issue with these things, um, but um, I, I would certainly like to um, like to try and make sure that some um, some reporting. Uh, is undertaken on the the way in which we've approached this and the way in which it's been undertaken um, and in the interim 
you know, bearing in mind how busy everybody is and how long it might take to get a sort of formal report um, together, I'd be really happy to talk with anybody about the specifics of anything that we've done, um, if they think it might help. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Okay. I think we're, oops. Uh, Martin Newman, have you considered publishing the data via an API feed? It's not really for me to say. I mean, it's 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 perfectly possible and doable. Um, we do it with other um, resources that are sitting on Harris, but that's really a data management yeah. um, question for the watch. Yeah, it certainly hasn't been considered to date. No. Um, or the GIS data by WMS, uh, WFS. I mean, that's trickier because um, so much of what is on our Hulu isn't owned by the so in terms of bringing those da that data together from all different sources um a lot of it they just don't really have the rights to serve out a uh, wfs at wms or api um of, of the whole thing so to speak um it would really have to be just focused yeah, I was going to, yeah he's there. just had, i was just about to say perhaps possibly just oh, the raw data is a possibility uh, and ben's just added just the hergis data uh, which is a possibility. Uh, yeah. Again, we haven't looked directly at that at the moment, um, but it's certainly something that we could consider in the future. Yeah, and it's definitely, I mean, so I know other organisations using Haros for their HERs who who do that, who have that as a function of their data sharing, yeah. um, provide data by WFS and WMS. um martin uh we're publishing the um little plug there yeah data via an api um ag launch tomorrow there you go yeah i would love to sadly i'm heading off to pembroke just to do some uh, lidar training for volunteers so uh, my my availability is very limited this week <laughs> apologies for that uh, um, yeah, I, uh, presumably if these are all being recorded they will be being made available is that does anybody know uh, well, team? Elizabeth can answer that better than I can, but yes, I believe it's the yeah, answer. Yeah, that's what, that's what I thought to people who were at the conference to begin with and then later on more Thanks. widely, I think. So hopefully I'll be able to catch your presentation on uh, Catch Up, Martin. Thanks for highlighting it. Yes, apologies. Sorry, I was struggling with my computer. Uh, yes, <laughs> this is all being recorded and it will be available after the fact. Um, we're not entirely sure. How soon our, soon our hope is to get it up within the next week or so. Great, thank yeah. you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, we seem to be running out of questions. There's none coming in at the moment. Um, Sean, Rebecca, have you got anything else that you want to add at this stage? No, I don't think so. Um, Not for me. Anybody can get in touch directly with us if they have any any other questions about anything. Yep. So I think any any queries, um, relevant ones, either to the Gwyneth Archaeological Trust, certainly, or to Rebecca at Pushing the Census, um, we'd be very happy to receive any queries uh, and we'll try and respond to them as best we can. Um, other than that, I think we're we're a fraction early, I'm afraid. So I'm sorry about that. But I think it's probably rather than to hang on um, with nobody saying anything, we'll uh, we'll call a halt to it uh, to the um, to the meeting. Um, thanks very much, everybody, for coming to listen. I'm very grateful to you all, um, and I hope that you found it of some interest uh, and uh, and some use. Thanks very much.